Makes that happen much later. Yeah. Good morning. Um, I call the hearing of House Finance Education Committee together. We have a lot of fun energy today in the room, which is awesome because we're going to be talking about some two amazing bills. But first, we're going to go over the minutes. Um, Vice Chair Clardy, have you had a chance to review the minutes for January 26th? Yes, I have. Um, would you like to move the minutes for January 26th? So moved. Members, we have the minutes for January 26th in front of us. Um, any questions or concerns about the minutes? Give everybody a minute to settle in. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The minutes for January 26th are adopted. Um, with that, our next item on the agenda is House File 18. It is the chair's intention to hear this bill and lay it, lay it over for possible inclusion in an education bill. Uh, Representative Walgamot's before us. Representative Walgamot, welcome to the Education Finance Committee. Um, with that, would uh, Vice Chair Clardy like to move House File 18 before us? So moved. Thank you, Representative Clardy. Um, House File 18 is before us now. Um, Representative Wolfmop, would you like to present your bill? Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. I am here before you this morning to present House File 18. Um, Representative Wolfman, I forgot, we do have a, 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 a one amendment, A18 amendment. Um, uh, Representative Vice Chair Clardy, would you like to move the A18 amendment? So moved. Thank you. Um, the A18 amendment before us, do you just want to briefly discuss the A18 amendment? And I'm, I'm seeing motions that it's not 18, it's A1. Sorry about that. Um, Vice Chair Clardy, would you like to withdraw the A18 amendment? Uh, yes, I'd like to withdraw the motion. Uh, Vice Chair Clardy withdraws the A18 amendment. Um, members, we have the A1 amendment before us. I should actually take out the bills and put them in front of me. Um, so. Representative Vice Chair Clardy, would you like to move the A1 amendment? I'd like to move the A1 amendment. Thank you, Vice Chair Clardy. Now that we have that settled, Representative Walgamot, would you like to um, address the A1 amendment briefly, and then we'll move on. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Madam Vice Chair. Um, yes, this is just a technical amendment cleaning up some language in consultation with MDE. Thank you, Representative Walgamot. Members, any questions on the A1 amendment that's before us? Representative Krisha. What exactly are we cleaning up? What is technical? Representative welcome on. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would defer to uh, House Research to further explain these technicalities. Um, Mr. Strong. Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, when the bill was first drafted, the goal was to uh, uh, ensure that it was the adjusted cost subsidy that was being 100% funded. And a little bit of the language that was put in the initial draft, uh, MDC, MDE thought added uh, uh, less clarity instead of more. So the amendment clears up the, the language, existing language in 125A76 uh, uh, does provide for that to be the adjusted cross subsidy. So the language is technical in that it gets the bill aligned with the way the calculation is currently made. Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Representative Krisha, follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Members, um, any questions on the A1 amendment? No further questions. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The A1 amendment's adopted. The bill's in the shape the author would like. Go ahead, Representative Volkman. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you, committee members. I'm here before you this morning to present House File 18, which is a bill to fully fund Minnesota's special education cross-subsidy. Madam Chair and members, there are so many reasons why I'm proud to be a St. Cloud School District 742 parent. One of those reasons is that we are a leader in our region and in our state in providing special education services to students with special needs. I'm proud of our school district for the opportunities they provide for our special education students. I'm proud of our special education educators who pour their hearts and souls into their jobs. And most importantly, Madam Chair, I'm so proud of our special education students and their families and the joy that they bring to our schools and the opportunities that they bring to our communities. I'm proud that our school districts provide special education services. It's the right thing to do. But also, Madam Chair, Minnesota requires 
that school districts provide as special education services. Again, I want to emphasize this is the right thing to do. These services are critical to our students with special needs to help them reach their fullest potential. But unfortunately, Madam Chair and members, Minnesota has never fully funded this mandate. And this is a real problem for our students and for our state and for our workforce. This huge cross subsidy affects all of us. Special education needs are rising rapidly, yet the funding shortfall keeps on growing. We're seeing students that have increased needs, which again, I'm proud that our school district is there to fulfill those needs. But because of those increased needs, it's led to greater expenses. And in fact, Madam Chair, it is projected by MDE that our special education shortfall for fiscal year 2024 will be $751.8 million. And by fiscal year 2027, it's projected to be $984.8 million. And in my school district, the adjusted net cross subsidy was over $10.8 million for fiscal year 2021. And for those members who are curious about what the shortfall will be in your district, we can get you those numbers in a handout, but it affects every school district. Now there's no signs allowed in committee, but I do have a sign over in the corner that you can look at after committee that shows every red dot shows which school districts in our state have the special education cross subsidy shortfall. Spoiler alert, it's all of them. So go and check and you'll see school district that you represent there on, the, on that chart that you can't look at until after committee. So we follow the rules. And unfortunately, Madam Chair, to make up for the difference in shortfalls, our schools are forced to use general, fund, general classroom funds to subsidize special education expenses. Again, that's what's referred to as a special education cross subsidy. So really, Madam Chair, we're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul and pitting students against each other for funding. This is not the right way to do this. We need to do better as a state, and all of our students deserve to have their education fully funded. So Madam Chair and members, that's why I'm here to present House File 18, which will fully fund the special education cross subsidy. As you can see, the bill itself is pretty straightforward. On line 1.2, the bill funds the special education cross subsidy for 100% of fiscal year 2024 and later. So instead of passing 94% of the buck onto our school districts, we're gonna step up, we're gonna put our money where our mandates are, and we're going to fund 100% of the special education cross subsidy. Now, Madam Chair and members, I know what you might be thinking by taking a look at this fiscal note that $1.6 billion for the 24-25 biennium and $1.9 billion for the 26-27 biennium is pretty expensive. And to that I say, you're right, it is expensive. Just ask our school districts who are being forced to take on these costs that we're mandating on them. Just ask the teachers and students who are missing out on opportunities because we're not funding these expensive mandates. Minnesotans are gonna pay for this one way or another. We're either paying for it by denying our children opportunities or our school districts are forced to pay for it by shifting the burden of these costs onto their local taxpayers, onto seniors, onto people who are living in our homes and on our neighborhoods. So again, Madam Chair and members, this is not the right way to fund our education system. This is not the right way to make sure our students have the opportunity that they need to succeed. That's why I'm putting this bill forward. That's why I'm asking for your consideration to fully fund our special education cross subsidy. And with that, Madam Chair, I do have some testifiers from throughout the state, and we then will look forward to answering any questions that you or the members of your committee might have about House File 18. Thank you, Representative Wagamont. Representative Ben, I saw your hand go up. Can you wait until after the testifiers? Uh, I can, Madam Chair. I do have to leave for a meeting briefly at 11, but hopefully. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Wogelman will bring up the testifiers. First, I have Paul Farron, um, and then on deck is Rachel Cox. Paul Farron's gonna go over the bill and has a little bit more time, and then after that, we're gonna go to two minutes per testifiers. Paul Farron is remote. Um, go ahead and state your name for the record and proceed. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair Dab, or uh, not Chair Dabney, uh, Chair Yokeman. Uh, my name is Paul Farron. Uh, I'm the Special Education Funding and Data Supervisor uh, here at the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, I, I don't know what got sent from yesterday. Uh, this kind of came up about last minute. Uh, I 
believe I provided a spreadsheet that did a, based on the November forecast that would have had uh, 2015 through 2027 November forecasted uh, special education cross subsidy at the statewide level. Uh, oh, uh, and I, let's see if I can share my Yes, screen. yeah, Mr. Farron, we do have your spreadsheet, so don't worry about sharing your screen, that's fine, unless oh, you want okay. to. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess. Uh, if you have slides, go ahead. <laughs> sure, slides, we'll go that route. All right, uh, we'll pop this here, minimize this. Wasn't expecting to be able to share a screen. It's amazing now. <laughs> The joys right. of being able to still uh, do remote testimony. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, and thank you for allowing. Um, so I guess for my first slide, uh, this is a summary of the November uh, 2022 uh, forecast file uh, showing the trends in spending uh, versus revenue. Uh, so this is a total uh, in all special education, so not just state, but also federal. Uh, granted, like there's kind of the caveat with federal of uh, since the money is always expected that whatever schools are taking in, they are spending back out. Uh, so in a typical year, uh, it's now for fiscal year 23, $219 million is how much money we're getting from the federal government. Uh, it's basically just assuming that the money that comes into the state on the revenue side is also the same money that the schools are just spending dollar for dollar out. Uh, while they might move money around from one year to the next, since the money does fully get you know, spent in the years, uh, it kind of just kind of flows through normally. And so, but it does show the total expenditures and then total revenues just offsetting at the two. Uh, but so the first slide just talks about uh, going back to 2003 through forecasted 2027, uh, the total special education expenditures, uh, the projected growth each year and uh, corresponding revenues based on both state special education aid, the funding formula, uh, revenue funds along with uh, MA, so the third party <coughs> revenue funds. Um, uh, then my next slide deals also with the cross-subsidy. Uh, the next two kind of in a, in a way get a little confusing in the fact that the numbers are both less than a thousand, uh, but the first one is referencing uh, the total special education cross-subsidy, so those numbers are actually in the millions. <laughs> Uh, so when you're seeing that 827, it's $827 million uh, is the projected cross subsidy out in 2025. Uh, so uh, just kind of quick little caveat for this. And then we adjust for inflation going back uh, for 2027, going all the way back to 2003. Um, basically the blue line is just the representation of the previous screen, the difference between the total cost and total revenues. Um, and, you know, again, is in the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and then last up is where we get into the, you know, what I think most schools always, we see the cross subsidy as, as it is this cross subsidy per adjusted membership. Um, and so it's kind of just how much money for every kid that your school district is serving on a statewide average, how much of the general education dollars are being used to fund the unreimbursed cost of special education. Um, 2021 was our low year uh, in you know, recent years. Uh, much of that is to do with how our special education formula is funded. Uh, you also notice on the like the spreadsheet type thing that was also provided, uh, that being like the low year uh, for the cross subsidy. Uh, but that's because again, uh, aid is based on prior year expenditures, and so 2020 we saw regular normal expenditures for you know. 80% of the school year. And even then for the, at the very start of the pandemic, uh, 2020, most schools just kind of remain staff on file uh, to ride out the rest of the year. Uh, 2021, on the other hand, because so many schools were remote, distant learning, um, transportation saw a, a very large decrease, as you can see on that spreadsheet, uh, along with uh, we didn't see quite the growth in what would be normal staffing levels as many schools uh, over the year generally lose paraprofessionals the most to just normal attrition uh, and were unable to always backfill those positions. And so we saw just a less of an increase in the programmatic side of special education. And so because 22 aid is based off of, or 21 uh, aid is based off of 20 costs, uh, it therefore makes 21 look like, oh, our cross subsidy actually took a large decrease that year. 
uh, but then immediately it bounces back in fiscal year 22 because now 22 is based on that lower spending of 21. And so now we have this large gap already between transportation uh, and also just larger gap as schools are able to start backfilling some of those lost positions as you know workers are gradually coming back to the workforce. Uh, those are the three slides I have specifically for this. And then also, uh, you know, here to answer and help with any questions uh, whatsoever. Thank you, Mr. Farron, and thank you for the compliment. Um, calling me um, Chair Davney just shows you how long that we've been working on this problem. Um, next up, we have Rochelle Cox, and then on deck, we'll have Kathy Nathan. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Rochelle Cox. Um, I'm the interim superintendent of Minneapolis Public Schools. Um, before that, I have been in special education for over 30 years, serving as a teacher um, to executive director of special education for Minneapolis Public Schools. Thank you, Representative Wolgamott, for authoring House File 18. This is an important bill for districts across our state, but most importantly, this bill is for our students and our families. All students were imp impacted by the pandemic, but our students receiving special education services were disproportionately impacted. The bonds that our teachers and our support staffs makes with students are a critical component to effective teaching, and that is even more important for our students receiving special education services. While our school staff made heroic efforts to connect with and support our students, those personal connections were often lost in distance learning. We see the impacts in our student data. While students receiving special education services in Minneapolis public schools remain stable on our assessments, we can continue to be concerned about their lack of growth. We also have concerns about skills not measured by assessments, skills like social skills, daily living skills, and regulating their emotions. When Minneapolis public schools first reopened, we prioritized students re receiving special education services first. Our students and our families were eager to get back in person learning. It was great getting students back in schools, but staffing shortages have hampered our ability to meet the needs of each and every student. Minneapolis public schools still has 52 special education teacher positions unfilled and 107 special education paraprofessional positions unfilled. This puts even more stress on our teachers and support staff who must do double duty. Support staff who our students depend on, including social workers, therapists, and health services staff. They're also very difficult to find. This bill will ensure that districts have the resources to hire and fairly pay our staff supporting students receiving special education services. It will also take the pressure off district's general fund budgets that will benefit all students. This bill would also address the impacts of special education tuition billing on district's ability to meet the needs of the students they serve. If special education <coughs> is not fully funded, I encourage you to address the rising cost of these tuition bills on district budgets. You will recall that when a student open enrolls or attends a charter school, the resident districts receives no federal, state, or local funding, must, but must cover up to 80% of the unreimbursed special education cost. Tuition billing costs make up roughly half of our school district's cross subsidy. I would like to leave you with a message I received from a parent. It really highlights the need to invest in our state's special education programming. Special education services are a lifeline, not only for our students, but for their families as well. School provides a place where her child can build independence, be able to learn on the job training, social emotional skills in the workplace, and how to access public transportation. These skills and the partnership with the school allow the family to experience a life plan for their daughter they were afraid to dream about when their daughter was in elementary school. And I got to visit her daughter working at Children's Hospital in the NICU uh, unit uh, uh, doing supplies. So that was really neat. Um, I think this also has a personal effect for me. Um, my uncle had cerebral palsy. And at that time, he had no access to education. He was not allowed to go to school. We have made that access possible now. And it's really time to fund it also. 
Thank the work you. you do in this committee has impacts in our classrooms and for our students' birth to adulthood. Madam Chair and, Re and Representative Wolgamart, thank you for prioritizing the needs of our special education students. I appreciate this opportunity to address you. Thank you, Superintendent Cox. Next up, we have Kathy Nathan and then Zach Dorholt. Folks, we have a long list of testifiers for both bills, so if you can keep your comments to two minutes, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, please state your name for the record and proceed. Madam Chair, committee members, Representative Waldemont, thank you. My name is Kathy Nathan. I'm a Rochester School Board member and a board member of the Minnesota PTA. And I'm here to ask you to support House File 18 and the full funding of the special education cross-subsidy. We were all very disappointed when the session ended last year without additional revenue to close the cross-subsidy. Parents and teachers were left with the certainty that our students' academic and social and emotional needs would continue to grow. And superintendents and school boards were left with the uncertainty of how we could continue to meet our students' needs while diverting millions of dollars from our general funds to fund the special education cross-subsidy. But it is a new legislature, and you have a new opportunity to take action. Schools aren't asking for anything extra when we ask you to close the special education cross-subsidy. Closing the cross-subsidy is not a bonus. It is a fair payment to make up for chronic underfunding of special education services that districts have had to pay from our general funds. Many districts, including mine, face budget deficits we have to close by considering laying off education support professionals and teachers. We have a $15 million special education cross-subsidy. Every school district in Minnesota has a special education cross-subsidy. We are asking you to fix the leak in our funding that has grown into a torrent that threatens to drown our innovative efforts to accelerate student achievement to make up for missed learning from the pandemic and provide social and emotional supports to support student and staff wellness. I know parents don't want to see budget cuts in services and programs and staff because the state legislature has not paid their school district what they are owed for providing special education services. School districts gladly serve all students who walk through our doors, no matter their specific needs. And all students are being harmed when funds are being pulled from the general education fund to cover the cross subsidy. I urge you to act through House File 18, and I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you, school board member Kathy Nathan. And next up, we have uh, another school board member from St. Cloud, and we have Mr. Dolholt on remote. Please state your name for the record and proceed. No, I'm Zachary Dorholt, school board member from ISD 742 St. Cloud Area Schools. <coughs> Madam Chair, members, and Representative Wolgamont, thanks for having me. I remember when uh, Representative Wolgamont was elected in 2018, um, half jokingly, but in all seriousness, said, hey, would you mind authoring a bill that might have a billion dollar fiscal note to it? <laughs> and at that time, that did sound quite intense. And at that time, not every school district was familiar with the term special education cross subsidy. Um, our district has been familiar with this for well over a decade. We've been down here on numerous occasions to um, point this out. And the term special education cross subsidy is a household term in St. Cloud. Um, we most people know what this means. It costs our district $15 million, um, and that is $15 million that could be used for extracurriculars and other staff positions. Um, we provide great services in our district. We're, we're proud of that, um, but it's, it's beyond time to start funding some mandates. I know you're hearing it at every committee. Hey, we got money. Now is the time. Um, and think about it. It's an unfunded mandate, and now it's a burden for every district in the entire state, and it's only going to get bigger if we don't uh, address it. Um, so that's, um, that's about all I have, and just thanks for hearing us out today. Thank you so much, former Representative Dorholt and school board member. Um, next up, we have John Morstad, and then finally, Maren Halden. Mr. Morst, uh, John Morstad, the Executive Director of Finance and Operations at Osseo is remote as well, so please state your name for the record and proceed. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is John Morset. I'm the Executive Director of Finance and Operations with Osseo Area Schools, the fifth largest district in the state serving about 21,000 students. I'm also the current Vice President of the Minnesota Association of School Business Officials or MASBO. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you regarding the special education cross subsidy and its effect on Osseo Area Schools and school districts in general. Osseo prides itself on being fiscally conservative. We've consistently maintained a healthy fund balance, but doing so has required us at times to restrict teaching innovation in order to remain fiscally solvent. Osseo's special ed cross subsidy is estimated at $28 million. We are very fortunate in that our district, um, because of our voters have approved local operating levies that help sustain us. Um, the intent of those levies when they were approved was to provide new innovation and improved educational opportunities for our students. However, today, the vast majority of those funds simply go to pay for cross subsidies. For the current year, our district is spending about 87 cents of every dollar generated from our operating levies to cover the special ed and uh, EL cross subsidies. Because of mandates like these, many districts throughout the state are regularly having to make cuts just to maintain current levels. Special ed and EL services are a critical component to education, but we are handcuffed by mandates to cover shortfalls in funding at the state and national level at a direct cost to every one of our students. At Osseo, we're currently deficit spending about $15 million this year, and we'll need to make cuts in the future just to maintain our current levels of service. This legislation would provide schools the flexibility to innovate so we can best serve all students. <coughs> schools notoriously have to have had strict spending limits just to get by. And this is a product of revenues consistently not growing at the same rate of inflation. Over time, this mindset has created a resistance to even try anything new or creative as it has routinely been denied due to cost. The result is schools that fall back on the same past practices to deal with today's new challenges and expect different results. The need of our students is ever changing and yet we simply do not have the ability to adapt to those needs. For example, mental health needs of our kids are much more complicated now than they've ever been. Financial flexibility provided by eliminating this cross subsidy could be used to better support those needs and keep students on the right track or even help those needing additional supports to recover successfully. I believe it's a common interest to educate all students in an equitable manner. Cross subsidies negate that promise. Not all districts have the same cross subsidy amount as the nature of each student attending any given district comes with different costs. Therefore, the impact on general education is variable for every single district. When consistent dependable funding is provided, all students will benefit as money will be available to, for sustainable programs like multi-tiered systems of support, regularly updated curriculum, access to 21st century learning spaces, just to name a few. In short, districts will have flexibility to determine what best meets the needs of their students. Osseo School strongly supports this legislation to fully fund special education. And on behalf of school business officials across the state, MASBO also strongly supports this legislation. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, uh, Executive Director Morstad. Finally, we have Marin Holden. Please um, come on up and state your name for the record and proceed. Good morning, Chair Yuki and members. My name is Marin Holden, and I'm a supervising attorney at the Minnesota Disability Law Center, which is a statewide project of Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. The Disability Law Center is Minnesota's designated protection and advocacy organization, and we provide free legal services to kids and adults with disabilities across the state. I supervise our work representing students who have disabilities on school-related issues and special education problems. This has been a difficult year for so many students who have disabilities. And there is a recurring theme that throughout many of the challenging cases that come through our door, staffing shortages. When schools can't staff to fill positions, this leaves students not only getting the services that they need, but often in very difficult situations at school. Without a paraprofessional as outlined in their IEP, some students are struggling with staying in the classroom at all or ending up in really unsafe situations, dealing with repeated suspensions or expulsions, um, and some are even finding school too overwhelming without adequate staffing to make it there. Um, and some students are missing out on key final years of services as they transition to adulthood. There are many students who need staff support to be successful in inclusive classrooms with their peers, 
But without that staff, they haven't been able to be successful. And now the schools are proposing to put students in more restrictive and intensive environments, which not only takes students away from their peers and inclusive learning settings, but oftentimes those environments end up being far more costly for school districts in the long run. The longer students go missing out on needed services, the further behind they get and the more work their teams and their staff need to do to help them get caught up. I can attest from the import, to the importance of staff being from my own kid's experience who just started kindergarten at a Minneapolis public school and he has a nearly full-time paraprofessional in his IP, which thankfully, miraculously, they've been able to staff. And he has had an amazing year where he spends almost all day in his classroom with 30 kids even though he's super sensitive to noise. And not only is this great for him and setting him up for success for the rest of his K-12 experience, but his peers love him. He gets invited to birthday parties, play dates, and these kids are now learning how to communicate with someone who mostly uses signs and a speech device. Inclusion really benefits all of our students. But I know there are so many who are not having the experience like my son, and what can be done? There are lots of things we need to do to address this crisis, but really the first and most pressing is simply more funding. Schools need special education funding to be able to recruit and retain staff, to fill open positions and provide services. There's nothing more urgent right now to, that I see to ensure that students get the supports they need to make that progress and not fall backwards, as we're seeing in so many cases. So thank you, Representative Walgamot, for your leadership on House File 18, which makes a really incredible commitment to our students and to our schools, a major step towards fulfilling a promise that we as a state will invest so that all students can be fully included. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maren Halden. Um, with that, members, I think we'll open up to testimony or for questions from members. I know Representative Bennett had to step out, so we have her on the list. But is there anyone else that has questions or thoughts? <laughs> Where's Ed West? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, quick question for Representative Wolgamont. Have you reached out to uh, any of our federal representatives to encourage them to fund this? Because we've gotten a lot of federal money for various things, but this is literally their responsibility. Have, have you uh, contacted them? And if so, what did they say? Um, Representative Walkamat. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question, Representative West. I share your frustration. You know, we have been waiting for the federal government to cover their promised 40 percent for decades, I think over 50 years. And we definitely need to urge them to step up to their commitment and do their job. But we as the state of Minnesota also have a commitment and an obligation to do that. So while I would welcome investment from our, from our federal representatives, um, I don't just want to sit back and, you know, it's been 50 years, we're still waiting. I don't want to wait another 50 years. I want to make sure that we do our part as the state of Minnesota, that we do our part to support our students and fund their education. Representative West, follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, yes, we need the feds to step up, and that's one of the, see, this is a good bill, but that's one of the most infuriating things is they said they would cover 40% of these costs, and we're still having to do it with our surplus, and that's a huge burden on our districts, and meanwhile, we get billions from the federal government for objective boondoggles like Southwest Light Rail that has been an unmitigated disaster, and that was Representative billions. Representative West, we're gonna to stick to the topic. So Thank we you. really need to invest Representative West, to please invest don't speak in over me. We're gonna to stick to the topic of education here, so um, I'll let you continue. Well, I was, I only spoke over, not to be rude, I only spoke over you because I was about to finish. <laughs> We need to invest in this, but the feds really need to step up as well. Thank you, Representative West. Next up, we have Representative Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Wolgamont. So I don't talk about my children very often because unfortunately on the campaign trail, people have said not nice things about my children who have special needs. Um, I wanna thank uh, Maren Holden who was up here just now. We, she and I have worked together a lot on just trying to make sure kids with special needs are taken care of and feel welcome in our schools. I have twin sons that were born at 24 weeks gestation, so um, they were really sick when they were born. And um, they, we had early intervention where people came to our home. Um, again, early intervention to make sure that they would be successful, where they didn't walk. Uh, my son lost part of his foot. Um, from a heart condition, and, and uh, they've had speech therapy and reading intervention, and just they have learning delays, and it's 
they have a, all these different things, but I can't tell you where they would be if we didn't have a special education system that that really works for people, which is why uh, my husband and I moved to Edina. Um, and I know that our cross subsidy is $8 million. Um, the shortfall is in Edina. And you know the, the amount of love and compassion um, that the special education teachers, because it's not just about the cross subsidy and about the kids, it's about the teachers. And, and Representative West, to your point, the federal government, when we passed IDEA, we, in 1975, we didn't fund it. You're, I totally share your frustration, so know that that's a bipartisan issue. <laughs> um, but, but the reality is, is we, ha we can't wait for the federal government. We just, we have to step up for our kids. Um, and I, you know, the one thing I also wanna highlight here is that based on your family's access to wealth, you might have more services. Like I'm able to get my kids, um, you know, reading tutoring and um, speech therapy outside of this, where so much of that needs to be embedded within a school. It is, but to the extent that we really could expand it, I think we need to support it, support our educators, and I just can't wait to vote for this. Thank you, Thank you Representative Edelson. I want to bounce back to Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair, just in time. <laughs> uh, so a question, Representative Wogamot, um, and I apologize if this was asked while I was had to step out, but in the fiscal note under long-term fiscal considerations, it says the increase, and this is um, by nonpartisan staff, the increase of the cross-subsidy aid factor to 100% could cause the cross-subsidy to grow, increasing the cost to the state over time, especially if districts are not incentivized to control costs. So my question for you is, are there incentives in your legislation to control costs, because this is a very real issue, and I, and I do agree the special ed cross subsidy is something we need to deal with, um, you know, as a state. The federal government is enacting. Um, I'm not sure if 100% is the correct way to go because of what this says. So what incentives are in your bill to to hold costs down? I represent Walmart. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question, Representative Bennett. Um, my legislation, as put forward, trusts our school boards and our school board members to be making prudent decisions about where their dollars are being spent. Um, I know, at least in St. Cloud, they're doing everything they can to be as thoughtful and as frugal and as responsible with our school dollars. Um, there's nothing in my legislation that, that controls uh, how these school board, how our school boards would be spending these dollars. The goal here is that our state is living up to its commitment and that we're fully funding the special education cross subsidy from the current factor of right around 6% to up to 100% uh, for fiscal year 2024 and later. Representative Bennett, follow Ma up. Madam Chair, thank you. And thank you, Representative Wolgamont. And, and I too, I trust our school boards and, and administrations and so on, but at the same time, this is a very real concern, and it's part of human nature. When something, when something is offered, we'll just say free of charge, it's not free, but um, there is in human nature is that uh, propensity to maybe use it a little more than is really needed. Or, and, that, and I think that's maybe what the, this statement in the fiscal note is getting to. And so I really feel like there should be incentives. I, I don't think there should you know, we don't need to come down hard on school districts or that kind of thing or, or overburden um, them with paperwork. But at the same time, I believe we should look into incentives to hold down the costs because this is a very real issue identified by nonpartisan staff. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Um, we're going to try to keep on our time schedule, but I have Representative Bakeberg, Pryor, Hill, and then Cresha. Representative Bakeberg. All right, I will, I'll try to make my comments brief. Um, um, Representative Wolgamont, thank you for bringing this important bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a big deal to schools across the state, and, and Representative Wolgamont laid it out well. Um, I think one of the kind of nuts and bolts things to, to go off of what uh, Representative Bennett talked about, S school staff love kids. They are passionate, and they, they go into education because they want to help and serve kids. Um, and I won't belabor Representative Bennett's point, but I, I think we have to think about how do, we, how do we provide services to kids and then remove those services when the kid isn't showing that they need that level of support. 
Um, and this kind of goes in to the next part of that fiscal note. Um, and it says, because the formula for special education cross-subsidy aid relies on prior year spending, any one-time drop in spending could lead to a future maintenance of effort support of the state. So, um, so that long-term fiscal considerations. What that, what that translate to, translates to on the local level, when we're making staffing decisions, um, our special ed director looks at what are the special ed needs across the district, and then we staff accordingly. Right now, it is very difficult to reduce um, staff because of maintenance of effort. We have to show, is there anything, Representative Wolgamot, to address <coughs> maintenance of effort uh, in the bill? Representative Wolgamot. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question, Representative. Uh, that is outside the scope of my bill. Really, the intention of it, the, the just of it, as you can see on line 1.12, is to take the cross subsidy factor that uh, equals 6.43% for fiscal year 2023, and then we would increase that to 100% for fiscal year 2024 and later. Uh, Representative Baker, follow up. Yeah, I would just say that would be something we could we could talk more about to address that piece, um, because that's that's one of a solution to address a staffing issue while also addressing Representative Bennett's concern about um, not, not over-servicing kids is the language you'll hear in schools. Thank you, Representative Bakeberg. Representative Pryor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Olbutt, for bringing uh, this, this bill to us and also for your great rep uh, presentation and your speakers that you brought, and um, we're very glad that they could join us again to talk about this, this important issue. Um, I wanted to highlight what I think that you did well in your presentation and really appreciated is to say that what we're not talking about, you know, we keep using the word cross-subsidy, but that's, you know, we, we have to get out of that mindset. The problem is that the federal government and the state government are underfunding um, this segment of, of our student population and that it's been chronic. Because um, I know that when I started, started working with uh, um, lobbying and advocating for ed education, we identified what the issues were, and they kept talking about the underfunding of special education, and that's more than a decade ago. Um, and so it's, it's been persistent over this year, and now we know that um, you can call it a surplus, but really what it's reflecting is the fact that there are um, uh, investments that we're not making in our students. And to echo um, what uh, Representative Edelson said, when you know a child that receives one of these services and you know when they receive it in a timely manner, it is life changing. And it's not something that can be delayed. So appreciate your focus on the underfunding of our, our, our students in Minnesota. And, um, and this is one of the avenues and the important avenue for, for ending that underfunding and doing what's right. So thank, thank you, Representative Wolgemann. Thank you, Representative Pryor, Representative Hill. Thank you, Chair you, Akeem, and thank you, Representative Wolgamon, for bringing this forward. I'm gonna echo some of the things that uh, uh, Representative Pryor just stated. Uh, this is long overdue. Um, since I first heard the term cross-subsidy, I've been very uncomfortable with that language. Um, I believe that referring to uh, this need um, and, uh, you know, this, this just thing to do is is not something that should pit our special education students against our general ed students. And as we move forward in and do everything that we can to serve every child in Minnesota, um, these aren't those kids, these aren't some kids, these are all our kids. And it's the right thing to do to fund the needs uh, that, that they have. And so I'm very proud to vote yes and support this uh, bill, and I would urge you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hill. Uh, Representative Krisha. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I believe the intention is to lay it over. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, is uh, Mr. Morstat still on line? Yes, he is. Yes, sir. Go ahead, How are Representative you, Krisha. Uh, first of all, thank you for your work. Uh, the UFAR system is a mess. Uh, general accepted accounting rules would be way better for you guys. Um, but just a quick question for you, um, and, and for the committee members and Representative Wolgamont, thank you for your bill. I mean, there, there, 
I, I certainly I won't speak for everybody, but I, I, from what I've heard, there's no disagreement we need to address this. Um, and my comments, as anything I do here, as I tell the people I work with, when you come with an idea, um, we're going to polish and improve, and we're going to take these, you know, so every, every comment you hear is, how do we make this uh, the very best that we can get out of here? So I've heard a lot, and Mr. Moore said, I'll just ask you the straight, straight up question. Since uh, the deficit in the underfunding of special ed, um, those dollars come out of the general fund. Would you prefer that if we had no disagreement on the dollar amount that that money would come into the general fund and that you would address that or would you like it to go the other way around which is dropping in the categorical? Um, Mr. Morstead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, certainly, and thank you for the question. The, the general fund just keeps money as flexible to school districts as possible. Um, so, so it is always easier for us to manage that particular pot of money than adding another complication. A lot, a lot of the categorical funds, obviously there's restrictions to them and things we can and can't do. Um, where, where I guess today I look at it and say that, that we're using general fund dollars to cover a categorical today, it would be nicer to receive those back as general fund dollars. So, so we're free to use them um, wherever possible. So one of the examples I gave was, yes, we could use it for uh, programming in a classroom, but we could also use it for a capital project or, or for, say, 21st century learning with furniture improvements in, in buildings. Uh, the general fund would allow that. If that goes into categorical, most likely we would be allowed one or the other. Representative Krisha, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Morris. So, I, I mean, let, let's start with where we all agree, right? We all agree that there's a, a funding issue here, there's a deficit, and we're just talking about how those dollars could be uh, directed to schools. And so what I've heard from you is that going into the general fund would be more flexible, that you would still use those dollars to solve the deficit because you have to, um, but giving you more flexibility, you might be able to address other things, uh, like such things that Representative Backburn suggested, because you are, I'm scared, Bakeburn, excuse me. Um, my, my apologies, uh, that guy over there. Um, <laughs> So I, I just want to make sure we're in agreement there. If, I mean, if, we were, if we're solving the problem together, if Representative Wolgamont and, and everyone here, if we agreed we're solving the funding mechanism and solving that funding mechanism going into the general fund um, versus going straight to the categorical, you would see that as a, I won't say better, I'm not asking for judgment, but a more flexible solution. Is that correct? Mr. Morris said briefly, and then we need to move on. Thank you, Manager. Yes, sir, that is correct. Thank you, Representative Krisha. Really quickly. Very, very quick, really and I understand. I'm sure. So um, I guess the only thing that I would, I would offer again, thank you, Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think we should absolutely press our federal congressional. I think we also have to recognize the legislature. We have responsibility for creating this problem. Every time a mandate has come here and we've added to this, we've added to the schools. Uh, expansion of this. And I think we have to be very, very clear. I know they can be tear jerkers and hard things, and we don't want to deny services, but we also be, have to be very careful about what we place on our school districts. So thank you for your bill. Uh, Representative Wolgamot, final comments before we lay the bill over. Yeah, thank you again, Madam Chair, and thank you to each and every one of the members of this committee for the thoughtful conversation and consideration of House File 18 this morning. Uh, in closing, Madam Chair, I'd like for your you and your committee members to reflect on two things. First of all, I just want to reiterate the numbers of this fiscal note. $751 million in fiscal year 2024, $902 million in fiscal year 2025, $938 million in fiscal year 2026, $984 million in fiscal year 2027. These are real costs that are being inflicted on each and every one of our school districts, and it affects each and every one of the children in our districts. And, and finally, Madam Chair, that's where I would like us to focus on. We've had good discussions over the numbers and the details of the fiscal note, and that's important. But please reflect on what it would mean for each of the kids that are in all of our districts, what it would mean for their daily lives in their schools. We would have more access to mental health services. We would have lower classroom sizes. We would have more programs and opportunities and chances for our children to get the support that they need to thrive and succeed. So let's do that, Madam Chair, 
Let's step up. Let's put our money where our mandates are. Let's fully fund this special education cross subsidy. It is long past due. It's time to get this done for the benefit of all of our students. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. I appreciate your consideration for House File 18 and your finance omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Wolgamott, for bringing this bill forward with such um, passion and very directed to our kids that have the most needs in our schools. And that's the point sometimes of putting money on a categorical is to make sure the funding is distributed fairly to our schools so they can address um, the needs that they have in their district and that the money gets to the districts that have the most needs. So really do appreciate that. And I know everybody's frustrated about the federal money. Those discussions are ongoing. One thing I want us to remember, and as Representative Volgamot said, there are students behind these numbers and childhood doesn't have a rewind. We need to help these kids now. So thank you with that. I will lay over House File 18 as amended and we're gonna move on to the next bill. Um, House File 21. Um, Representative uh, Purcell, would you like to move House File 21 before the committee? So moved. Um, thank you, Representative Purcell. We have House 21 before the committee. Um, and Representative Bang, welcome to the committee. Um, I'll let you settle in here and you may present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to return to committee today to present House File 21 to fund full service community schools. Uh, the model was pioneered by Brooklyn Center that I'm proud to represent. Uh, the model recognizes that students' success requires that the needs of a student are met both within and out of the classroom. Oftentimes a school is a community hub for families and their children, and therefore it is a convenient location to address uh, the learning barriers students face in and out of the classroom. Uh, the school determines what is the greatest need for students outside of the classroom and works to provide that wraparound service so the student can continue to focus on learning. Uh, the bill will appropriate nine, $90 million ongoing from the general fund to the Minnesota Department of Education for grants under this model. This funding can go towards schools who want to start a full service community school, and much of the funding goes towards hiring a site coordinator to build relationships with community partners and implement the services. Or if the schools are already for full service, funding goes towards sustaining the model. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I would like to yield my time to my testifiers who can talk more about the full service community school. And I'll just per want to personally thank my testifiers here today. Uh, these are the leaders and the change makers for our students. And uh, I am incredibly thankful for the work that they do every day for our, school, for our schools and for our kids. And with that, Madam Chair, uh, I will yield my time. Thank you, Representative Fang. Um, first up, we have Deanna Horn from Deer River Full Service Community Schools, who's via remote and is gonna give us a brief overview and then we'll go on to other testifiers, but those will have to cut down to two minutes at least just because we're cutting close on time. So, um, Deanna Horn, please state your name for the record and proceed. Good morning, my name is Deanna Rohn and I'm the Full Service Community School Coordinator at King Elementary School in Deer River. Um, I appreciate the time. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. We are a small rural school district in northern Minnesota that began implementing the full service community school strategy six years ago. I have been the um, coordinator for the elementary site for four years. Um, I came across a quote in the past couple of days that said, we should allow nothing to get in the way of providing students with the high quality teaching they need to succeed. I would think that most people would agree with that statement. Currently, there are barriers getting, the, getting in the way of our students receiving high quality instruction. These barriers include lack of adequate stable housing, transportation, access to medical, dental, vision, and mental health services, to name a few. The full service community school model provides the opportunity to reduce those barriers so that students can learn and succeed. High quality teaching isn't going to matter if the student isn't in school or is unable to concentrate because of a toothache. A community school is both a place and a set of partnerships between the school and other community resources. Its integrated focus on academics, health and social services, youth and community development and community engagement lead to improved student learning, stronger families and healthier communities. Each school contains unique assets and resources, specific needs, vision and goals. Many schools have pieces of this strategy which brings what brings a community school together is the coordinator. 
the coordinator creates, strengthens, and maintains the bridge between the school and the community. Community school coordinators facilitate and provide leadership for the collaborative process and development of a continuum of services for children, families, and community members. With student needs increasing and the rising costs associated with education, increasing the community school strategy can bring community resources into the schools that support students and families. The estimated return on investment for a community school is $7 for every dollar invested. Bringing in partners that provide services to students and families is the job of the coordinator. My district is located in northern Minnesota. Many of the barriers that exist in large districts also exist in small rural districts. This model works because it isn't a one size fits all. The needs of the students and families are identified and then the coordinator looks for partnerships that have, can assist in meeting the identified needs. One barrier that exists in my district is transportation. Our students are transported from a 500 mile square radius each day. Many of our students ride the bus for an over an hour one over an hour one way each day. If a student misses the bus, there is a good chance that that student is going to miss school for that day. There is no public transportation. There is no public transportation and many of our families lack transportation. Once again, students are missing out on high quality education due to a barrier. This year, Deer River Schools is piloting a second van route to pick up students who missed the bus. We have increased our attendance and decreased our chronic absence percentages. We provide a service that is needed by our families that don't have access to transportation. This becomes an equity issue as students who have the ability to get to school if they miss the bus receive high quality education for at least part of a day. And the students who do not have access to transportation miss the entire day of instruction. The full service strategy has the potential to assist with many barriers that students and families face. For example, food insecurity, bringing resources to school rather than parents traveling to the resources and transportation. Teachers working in full service schools have many more resources to draw from to assist their students. The Deer River teachers participated in an educator needs assessment. When asked if the quality and outcomes of programs was assessed in the Deer River District, 75% of our teachers responded that that was true or mostly true compared to the state average. In the same assessment, fewer Deer River teachers were considering leaving the profession due to burnout. The full service community school model is presided providing essential resources for families that impact a student's ability to succeed in school. I would like to thank you for hearing my testimony and thank you to Representative Vang for authoring House File 21. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Rashida Fuller and then Lillian Garcia. If you could both come up to the table, then we could make this go a little quicker. I'll have uh, Rashida Fuller go first. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Hello, I'm Rashida Fuller. I am the full service community school coordinator at Excel Academy. We are transforming into a community school. Part of a community school strategy is to have a community school leadership team. This team drives the mission and the vision helps us create and analyze the needs assessment data and creates a community plan, I'm sorry, a community plan based on data from the needs assessment and implements our community plan within our school. Our leadership team has parents, staff members, students, and community partners. The community school strategy is powerful in transforming. It allows parents and students to be a part of the planning and the implementing process. This strategy not only allows parents and students to voice what they need to be successful in their school community, they get to see it implemented. This interaction between our students and our parents is transforming our, our school community and it's, and it's made possible by the funding we receive. House File 21 would ensure that hundreds of schools 
undergo this transformative process. Thank you. Thank you, um, Coordinator Fuller. Next up, we have Lillian Garcia. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Liliana Garcia. Hello, my name is Liliana Garcia, and I'm a representative on the Full Service Community School leadership team at Excel Academy. My role as a parent representative is to ensure our parents' voices and needs are heard, are heard and are being reflected into the implementation process of the Full Service Community School Plan at Excel Academy. As a parent, this is an exciting opportunity as naturally we would like to see our community thrive. With this full service community strategy, we are able to provide a one-stop shop for students and families. When families thrive, students will be on the path to success in school and in the future as a member of the community. Thank you for your support. Thank you so much. And next up, we have Gabrielle then Bye. Please state your name for the record. I'm sorry if I pronounced it wrong and proceed. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Ba. I'm a seventh grader at Excel Academy. I'm a student leader, also known as the voice of the students on the full service community school leadership team. What I appreciate most about our full service community school strategy is that since I am a student leader on the leadership team, I get to survey all the students at my school, analyze the data and make sure it gets into our community school plan. Then I am also a part of the process of implementing what all the students at Excel deem to be important to us. For example, students get to determine what mental health services look like at our school. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Um, we have Angela Smaller and then Diamico Fuller and um, New Sims, why don't you all come up at the same time? Oh, well, actually, two of them are remote. So we'll, we'll have Angela Smaller. <coughs> Angel, sorry. That's okay. Smaller. <laughs> um, good morning. My name is Angel Smaller, and I'm the community school site coordinator at Brooklyn Center Middle and High School. Thank you, Representative Vang, Chair Uakame, and members of the committee. Um, I'd like to speak briefly about the services we offer and how they translate to improve student wellness and performance. So paired with take home food support programs, BC schools provide breakfast before school and dinner during our after school programs. And along with this, our district has resource rooms at every site which are fully stocked with clean clothes, hygiene items, hygiene items and extra winter gear. Um, I've seen students lose everything to a house fire and leave school at the beginnings of a new wardrobe the next day, as long as new parents to the state who were not either equipped or able to outfit their students for the winter. Um, students take off the next day sort of with gear for their commute. Um, not to mention the dozens of requests for deodorant for middle school teachers each week. Many of the items in the resource room are provided via donations, which can be inconsistent and unreliable in contrast to the constant needs of our students. Um, at my site, the middle and high school, we're lucky to have a health resource center, which operates as a full service clinic for our students and broader community inside of the building. Um, the HRC offers a full slate of services from eye exams to um, vaccination clinics all the way through to routine checkups. Um, and then from my observation, students are offering, often carrying more baggage with them than any one teacher can address or solve. The, par the partnerships we have as a district provide students with more opportunities to open up about their mental health to the trusted adults and responsive adults and it takes some of the strain off of our teachers. Um, from last December to this December, our percentage of habitually truant students has dropped from 30 to 12 percent. And along with this, suspensions have gone down by 45 percent over the course of the last year. However, our ability to expand this network and sustain this work depends on a more reliable funding stream. And a $90 million investment would help thousands of students throughout the state receive adjacent services. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, Coordinated Sm Coordinator Smaller. Um, I, we will, may have time for some Questions at the end, so I want to make sure folks stick around. Um, next up, we have D'Amico Fuller from uh, that sub remote test file. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good morning. My name is D'Amico Fuller, and I am a community school site coordinator for Brooklyn Center Schools. Thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to appear before you today and the importance of the funding for community schools. When serving our scholars, we quickly realize that no matter how amazing, understanding, or engaging our teachers are, none of it matters if a student comes to school hungry, 
told from the lack of proper winter gear or worried about being teased for not having clean clothes or proper items to allow them to maintain their hygiene. We often see students build relationships between staff, especially teachers, and family strengthen because of the resources we offer and we demonstrate that we take a holistic approach and deeply care about the well-being of our community. Right now, we have dozens of families and relate, that have relationships with our family liaisons, linking them with resources and programs that meet their basic needs. Something as simple as a morning snack, free laundry detergent to ensure a family has clean clothes for the week, or bigger things like eye appointments, dental appointments, or health services provided right on site. Those things eliminate the potential barrier of a parent having to choose between having enough gas to get a, stu a student to school or just enough gas to get them to a doctor's appointment. They shouldn't have to choose. Both should be a priority, and our children need and deserve both. Following the killing of Dante Wright, as the stores were birded up and we, we opened up a distribution resource center, we distributed household and hygiene products, fresh food, diapers, and we served more than 1,800 individuals per day in the course of like two weeks. The distribution resource center took about 100 volunteers to operate. These examples are precisely why it is critical that uh, community schools are funded in communities like mine. We are able to meet the needs of the whole child, which gives them the space to move them forward in authentic learning, which ultimately impacts the picture of their growth. That's why we focus so much on the picture of the growth of our babies and not the proficiency and measures as a snapshot in time. We know that we have to engage our parents. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's required as our leadership, as the full service leadership group, it calls for 30% of representation from our parents. So we have a district advisory parent committee board, and it's an opportunity for our parents to advise on a high level of district practices and procedures. Parent and family engagement is a continual work in progress in the public school system. The full service community school models flips the script and creates robust family engagement in our school community, which engages families in the ways they want to be engaged. By providing our families with basic resources while giving them the voice at the table, we are able to build trust within our community. Building trust allows families to be more engaged and willing to share with us their needs and especially the needs of their children. Funding full service community schools will allow us to continue this work and also change the negative experiences communities of color have had in the education system. Thank you. Thank you, Coordinator Fuller, and for all your work on making sure our parents feel connected to the schools. Next up, we have Nuhu Sims, who's also remote. Please taste, state your name for the record and proceed. Good morning, my name is Nuhu Sims. I'm the Director of Equity for Brooklyn Center Community Schools. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that uh, we stand on the four pillars of community schools. One, integrated student supports. Two, expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities. Three, active family and community engagement. And four, collaborative leadership and practices. What that means is that every district leader and staff member is a part of making the efforts of community schools successful. We work in tandem uh, to make sure every aspect of our district is filtered through the four pillars uh, so that students can get what they need uh, from their basic needs so that they can engage in learning and have academic success. You should have in front of you a one pager uh, that details some of the, the, the academic outcomes that happen when you are running a full service community school. First, you'll see our, our demographics. Uh, we're 94% students of color. Uh, we are extraordinarily racially diverse. 20% of our students receive special education. 44% are learning English. 87% qualify for free and reduced lunch. Uh, we have a 20% mobility, mobility rate, just about 50% of our students open enroll, and 26% of our students reported some instance of homelessness in the past school year, and 6% are in foster care. So as you can see, not only are the needs of our community high, but there, it's, it's, it's uh, almost every need that's associated with having a positive learning experience whether you are new to the country and learning English or you are homeless and highly mobile, uh, we, we serve uh, a, a broad, a wide variety of young people with, with different needs. Because of the work we've been doing, our academic failure rate is down by 11, about 12%. And that trend is, is anticipated to continue. 
when we see progress being made in science and in ling English language arts. 91% of our pre-K students are meeting or exceeding school readiness standards. So even given all of the different um, <clears throat> needs of our community and trauma that, that our students are experiencing, they are still ready to come to school and learn. We consistently maintain about 90% overall proficiency for the past school for the past four school years, and specifically pre-pandemic. Our suspensions have decreased 95% since 2019-2020. Part of that is due to one of those pillars of collaborative leadership and practice. Um, the practices we've created different frameworks for restorative justice and restorative practices so that we can make sure that young people stay in the classroom and are allowed the opportunities to repair harm that's caused and restore uh, the well-being of the community so that they can get back uh, and be in a positive learning environment. 80% of our students from grades 9 through 12 <clears throat> are in, are in uh, college prep courses and have the ability to earn college credit. 11% 11, 11 of these students go take off-campus classes. 71% uh, of our students are taking STEM courses and, and STEAM courses. 17% are taking career and technical education courses. You can see that uh, our graduation rates are for indigenous students is 24% higher than the state. For our Asian students, 7% higher. Our African-American, African immigrant students, 8.2% higher. Latinx students, about 17% higher. And our, our multiracial students uh, are 4% higher. Our English learners, 16% higher than the state average. And our students on free and reduced meals are 12% higher than the state average. What I would say is, uh, just in closing, none of these things are possible without being a full service community school. As been mentioned by my colleagues and the other testifiers, when students aren't in the position to engage in learning, they cannot get to the learning. And what the full service community schools does is provide a wraparound of 360 degrees of support so that students before they come to school and during school and after school, they can get the things that they need so that they can be successful. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Director Simpson. Thank you for stating some of the statistics and successes you've had with your full service community school. Um, next up, we have an addition here, Becky Stromstead. Um, I believe you're here. Why don't you go ahead and state your name for the record and then the last testifier will be um, Adosh Uni. Hi, I'm Becky Stromstead. I am a teacher from St. Paul Music Academy. I teach third grade um, for the St. Paul Public Schools. Um, I currently work in a full service community model site um, and it works in partnership with the St. Paul Public Schools and the Wilder Foundation. Um, I have seen that our Achievement Plus service model um, is successful and I kind of want to share my perspective from a classroom teacher perspective. Um, I've taught in St. Paul Public Schools for 19 years. And during that time, I worked um, in two sites that were full service community schools and two that were not. As I began my teaching career in a, the traditional setting, um, I was excited to provide students with an education that provided um, rigor and high standards. I quickly learned that students walking through my door had needs that had to be met before the learning could happen. Um, students and families arrived with food shortages, housing, housing instability, um, limited access to transportation, this impacted their academics. Many of the students had difficulty focusing and performing in school. Um, and I knew moving forward, if we wanted to focus on academics, we had to address these barriers. So as a teacher, and like many teachers do every single day, we felt it was our job to track down winter clothing, food for families, um, working with social workers to help with transportation, putting families in touch with medical and dental services. This work was exhausting. Um, all this time and energy spent on these other efforts put a lot of strain on teaching and the classroom instruction. When I moved to SPMA, I began working in the full service community model, and it was a breath of fresh air. The coordinator was able to help students address potential barriers to learning. 
I didn't have to. Students were provided access to clothing and winter gear through our family center. Students' eyes were tested and their glasses were shipped directly to the school at no cost. When students experienced housing instability, our coordinator, coordinator was able to get them the resources needed for safe and stable housing. Students' mental health was addressed and aided through embedded therapists. Mm -hmm. Dental services were also provided on site. Our coordinator built community partnerships to help enhance educational experiences of students. They received access to sports camps and equipment. Students had opportunities to attend day camps and performances. I cannot stress enough just how valuable the full service model has been to the learning and stability of my students. When students' needs are met and they feel connected to their community, they thrive not only academically, but in all areas of life. And I'm able to be a teacher and focus on instruction. Teaching is hard enough, and I have loved that I can be a content expert such as math and reading and not an expert in food access. Having taught in both settings, I would um, only want to work in the full service model. Thank you for the opportunity to share my classroom experiences. I ask that you support House File 21 to help expand full service sites and give more educators, students, and families a chance to benefit from this model. Thank you for bringing your um, experience in working in both types of schools, and um, it's really helpful for us to hear that. With that, uh, I have a Doshuni. Please, from MDE, please take your name for the record and proceed. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Members, my name is Adosh Uni, and I am the Director of Government Relations with the Minnesota Department of Education. Thank you for the opportunity to provide support for investments in full-service community schools. As you know from the department's presentation last week, Governor Lieutenant Governor proposed a slightly different amount in the 2023 education budget, about $14.5 million one time. But the administration is, is more than happy to provide support for investing in full-service community schools. Uh, this model is an evidence-based improvement strategy designed to help schools support students and their families so that they can fully engage in high-quality learning opportunities. The community school model helps schools to actively build strong webs of support around the following four pillars. Active family, student, and community engagement, collaborative leadership driven by continuous improvement, integrated student supports, and then rich learning opportunities. Just for a little context, historically, Minnesota's Full Service Community <coughs> School Grant Program was established in 2015 to provide and establish uh, the Full Service Community School model in school communities across Minnesota. $1.3 million was appropriated in 2016 and 17 and provided 13 startup grant awards with 18-month uh, grant periods. 12 of the 13 schools originally funded continue to practice the model today. These schools and more schools each year continue to meet and network as the Minnesota Coalition of Community Schools. New districts and school sites have adopted the full service community school model as they have seen promising results from Minnesota and across the country. Some of the general results of this model from around the country show that schools truly transform into community hubs that students and families want to engage with. There are shared decision-making avenues with access to resources that are created with students and families, leading a lot of those discussions and strategies. Students end up excelling academically, and there's enhanced local capacity for problem solving. More uh, specifically, benefits include improved school climate, innovative and inclusive approach approaches to discipline, increased attendance, reduced chronic absenteeism, stability and enrollment and staffing, increased expectations around graduation and career and college readiness. Uh, other benefits are thoughtfully designed expanded learning time and opportunities provided by community schools, like longer school days and academically rich and engaging after school <coughs> weekend and summer programs. And these are associated with positive academic and non-academic outcomes, such as improvements in school attendance, behavior, and ac academic achievement that I mentioned before. The meaningful family and community engagement found in community schools is associated with positive student outcomes, again, such as absenteeism being reduced, academic outcomes improving, and student reports of more positive school climates. Um, this can increase trust among students, parents, and staff, which of course in turn has positive effects on student outcomes. 
And then uh, finally, comprehensive community school interventions have a positive impact with programs in many different locations showing uh, improvements like in graduation requirements and reduced racial and economic achievement gaps. And just uh, from the discussion today, we know that many, many, despite these positive outcomes and the history of funding it in the past, we know that many schools that are interested in this model aren't able to establish it without this additional funding, technical assistance statewide through the networks and at the department, and the ability to have those networking opportunities that uh, this proposal and in the governor, lieutenant governor's budget would, provi um, would, pro um, would provide. So um, this is a highly effective model, as mentioned. It has positive incomes in schools around the country and in Minnesota, and we're happy to provide support for this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uni. Um, with that, members, uh, we have about five, six minutes for questions, and then I want to give the um, author final words. So, Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. Uh, for, for bringing this bill. Uh, the wraparound services are obviously very important. Um, quick, qu Just two quick questions. Is, um, is there anything currently uh, stopping schools from taking this concept and applying it to their individual school district? Any, any statute in, in, uh, from MDE or that you're aware of that would limit schools from doing this? Representative Vang. For um, for Brooklyn Center, uh, Brooklyn Center is one of the full uh, uh, one of the few school districts that are full service, and so I think um, it makes it easier for Brooklyn Center to implement those uh, services and and provide those wraparound uh, needs, uh, just because the school district is entirely full service model. Other school districts that are um, larger, um, I, I believe it's harder for schools who want to opt in into the full service community model, uh, they uh, need to find sources of funding. And oftentimes that source of funding has come from the state. And perhaps um, Adosh can uh, confirm that too as well. Uh, Mr. Uni, looks like you've approached the table. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Bakeberg, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, there is the opportunity to employ this model with general fund opportunities. But we've seen, as Representative Bing mentioned, without the dedicated funding to this model, districts are left with a choice between many different options to serve their students. And so we've seen that challenge and tried to answer that with some directed funding through the ARPA funds um, over the last two years, full service community schools. Um, in your work in, in, in schools may have seen that. One of the allowed uses was full service or directed uses was full service community schools. Uh, we've seen that when we've had these opportunities for this directive funding that provides guidance in statute for startup grants as well as implementation grants, districts and charters jump at the opportunity. So we know there's a demand out there for this dedicated funding. And we believe with a dedicated model de uh, for funding specifically for this evidence-based approach, um, this will create a clear set of funding for at the school level, but also be able to provide funding for networking opportunities around the state, and as I mentioned, support at the department to really help with effective implementation. Representative Bakeberg, follow up. Yep, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for, for your comments. I just want to make sure, is this funding available to every district across the state, or is it only current grant, re grant recipients under the statute and then schools identified as low performing under ESSA? Representative Bank. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the $90 million, uh, is is to highlight what would it look to fully uh, fund all the school sites that qualify uh, for this funding. Um, and so usually they would take an analysis, and perhaps uh, MDE and Doge can confirm what sort of analysis they look at. They look at percentages, free and reduced lunch um, um, applicants or uh, students who've come from marginalized communities, for example. So. Um, this 90 million funding takes a look at what would it look like to fully fund all the school sites across the state that qualify. Thank you. Representative Beckberg? Yeah, thank you. So, so if I'm understanding right, it does not, every school district across the state is not eligible for this funds. And, and I, I just want to highlight that $90 million, um, which I think that would be fantastic for these specific sites, but that's about a 1% formula increase across the state. And a school district that has about 2,000 students in it, 
That's $180,000 that a local school district could use to fund this across the state. And, and as a building principal, and one of the first things that I jump to is I would hire a, a social worker, a counselor, someone in that vein to coordinate this. So I think we have to, uh, going back to one of our previous testifiers about, um, um, about uh, being handcuffed by mandates and having more flexibility uh, to represent Acretia, doing a 1% increase across the board would allow all students across Minnesota to benefit from this. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bakeberg, I just want to draw your line to, atten line, to attention to lines 1.15 to 1.17. It does say um, identified as low performing under the federal uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, but also any other applicants. So this is very directed funding. It's, I assume it's a competitive grant. Um, uh, Mr. Uni, did you want to add anything before we move on? We don't have much time, and I have still have two other, three other members on the list. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair and, and Committee, I, I mean, I, I think Representative Bakeberg's point is, is well taken, but an interesting one. Um, this is about providing opportunities for uh, districts and charters to have uh, provide dedicated or directed services for their families and, uh, and students. And I think proposals like this offer an empowering opportunity for students, families, and educators to advocate for what type of community school that they would like to serve their needs and serve the needs of the community. Thank you. I have Representative Bennett. Madam Chair, I will uh, wait for Michael. I do have a question for Mr. Uni, but I can take that offline. But uh, concerning data and reading proficiency, math, and so on, but I'm going to defer to our lead here because we don't have a lot of time. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you, Representative Bennett. I've got Representative Pryor, then Kresha. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And obviously, I should make my comments brief. Um, I do appreciate the targeted nature of this, that we know that we have disparities in Minnesota, and this is a uh, evidence-based model for addressing disparities rather than addressing education across the state. Um, I was able to visit uh, my school district, that's uh, part of the program, with it, which is West Junior High, and what is amazing, I was there on a Monday morning, there's so much energy in that building, first thing on a Monday morning, um, but what was amazing is how this local control addressing highest needs, how quickly you can go from identifying a need, problem solving solutions, and implementing them in the space of just a couple weeks. Um, and um, it's the action that's taken and what the whole atmosphere and climate that it created when students, knows, when students know that they go to school, they're seen, they're valued, and um, they're being addressed as a whole person and a whole family and a whole community. So um, thank you for, for piloting this in um, this model and for spreading it to their state and, and uh, addressing these funds in a targeted way for addressing the disparities we have in Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Pryor. Representative Krisha. Thank you, and I, I promise very brief. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Representative Vang, I want to thank you personally. Uh, I think that as a program, there's a lot we have to work through, and I think there's a lot of mechanisms. But what you've done here is you continue to bring issues, and we're a finance committee, and we'll talk about programs. But I just want to thank you because I know that what you really brought to this committee today, and I want to thank the young testifier and all the other ones, uh, when you bring people here who are talking about the issues and they're already working on solving that, Hopefully that becomes seeds that we can get other schools thinking about that and moving along. But um, you know, there there will be lots that we have in front of this committee. But I just thought it was important to thank you for bringing the testifiers. Thank you for the issue, and I really do want to thank. Uh, I know the courage it takes to do at your age, and fantastic. Thank you, Representative Krisha. Uh, Representative Fang, final word. Well, I'll just keep this brief. This is a good bill. I want to thank the committee uh, for your time and your questions. And most definitely, thank you to the testifiers. Uh, you've all been inspirational to me especially and, and hopefully to all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Vang. And thank you so much for bringing this bill forward. And also thank you to the testifiers, um, especially our students and teachers and coordinators that are living this, living this program and letting us know how well it works. So with that, members, I lay over House File 21 um, for further in, uh, possible inclusion in an education finance bill. Wanted to give folks a heads up tomorrow. We're going to read, we're going to hear from Representative Her about the ELL cross subsidy, from Representative Berg for the mental health support staff. But I also want to give the committee a heads up for your calendars. So Tuesday night, we're going to be having an evening hearing starting at 6 o'clock, uh, Tuesday the 7th. Thank you. With that, we're adjourned.